Welcome to daily news analysis of Shankaray's Academy. So today topic of discussion is first we are going to see about the semi-presidential system in the country of Sri Lanka. So this article is taken from the newspaper The Hindu and second we are going to see about the collegium system in the Indian judiciary from the prelims perspective detaily. So this article is taken from the newspaper Indian Express and last we have the push for ties in the new areas. So, they are talking about the relationship between the India and US in the defense sector. So, this article is taken from the Indian Express newspaper. So, all these three articles are taken from the today which is 23rd and yesterday's 22nd newspaper. So, without further delay, let us get into today's discussion. So, this article is taken from the Indian Express newspaper on the 22nd September. So, what this article says is that they, the center government has appointed 8 high court chief justices after the Supreme Court has pointed out its delay. So, on this backdrop, let us see about the collegium system of India. So, if you wonder what is collegium system, let us see it detailly from the prelims perspective. So, this collegium system, it is a unique system in India which is known for appointment as well as the transfer of the judges in the higher judiciary. So, talking about the judiciary, we have an integrated and an independent judiciary. So, what is independent judiciary. We have three organs of the government namely the executive, legislature and the judiciary. So, the legislature is having a job to make the laws while the executive will implement the laws made by this legislature. So, if there is any doubt regarding this law, the judiciary will interpret this law. So, they are not interfered by the executive and the legislature. So, they are called as the independent judiciary. So, now what is integrated judiciary? So, first we have the Supreme Court in the apex, under them we have the high court and lowerly we have the district court. So, if any case is not satisfied, they will move from the lower court to the upper court court and subsequently from the higher court to the supreme court. So, this is called as the integrated judiciary. For the purpose of appointment and the transfer of judges, we are going to use the collegium system. So, talking about the collegium system, so this is not explicitly mentioned in the constitution and it has evolved through a series of judgments called as the first judge case, second judge case and the third judge case which we will see subsequently. So, it is mentioned here, it is evolved through a supreme court judgments and not explicitly mentioned in the Indian constitution. So, here they have mentioned about the what is the composition of this collegium. First, we have the chief justice of India and four senior most judges in case of the appointment of supreme court judges. But in case of appointment of high court judges, the composition is chief justice of India and two senior most judges. So, here you have to make note of difference of the four and two senior most judges. So, now let us see about the judges case one by one. So, first we have the first judge case in the year of 1981. It is also known as the SP Gupta versus the Union of Indian case. So, what is the ruling of this case? What they say is that the executive is the primary role in case of the appointment and the transfer of judges and the Supreme Court Chief Justice of India has only consultative role. So, here the consultative role is the keyword. And now let us see about the next case which is the second judge case. This case occurred in the year 1993. So, this case occurred between the Advocate on Record Association, this is the Union of India. So, what happened in this case is that they overruled the ruling in the first case, which is the executive is the primary role and now they allowed the establishment of a unique system, which we are going to discuss, which is the collegium system. So, according to this ruling, the Supreme Court Chief Justice of India opinion is the primary one. And last, we have the important third judge case which is the 1998 case. So, before that we have to know about an article 143. So, this is called as the advisory jurisdiction. So, if the president is having any doubt, he can approach the Supreme Court to clarify his doubt. This is called as the advisory jurisdiction which is provided to the president under the article 143. So, so in second judge case, they led to the article uh, establishment of the collegium, but the composition was clearly defined in this third judge case, which is the one chief justice of India and another the four senior most judges. 
So, this is existing right now and this was established based on the third judgment case. So, the main objective behind this formation of the collegium is to ensure the independence of the judiciary so that it will be free from the influence of the executive as in the case of the first judgment case. So, what are the challenges in this collegium system? First is there is opacity and there is a lack of accountability. So, it led to the establishment of many reforms such as the NGAC which is the National Judicial Appointment Commission. According to the 99th amendment of 2014, this NGAC was established. So, the compound position of this NGAC is the Chief Justice of India, the two senior most judges along with it we also have the Union Law Minister. So, here you can see there is an interference of executive in the judiciary. We also have two eminent persons. So, talking about this composition of NGAC, we can see the interference of executive which is violating the independence of the judiciary. So, this NGAC was struck down in the year 2015. There is also ongoing debate on improving the transparency of the collegium system. So, these are the challenges with respect to the transfer of the judges. So, this article highlighted the fact that there is a delay in the appointment of judges. So, now we will see what are the causes for this delay. First is the executive delay. So, before understanding this, you have to know what is the process of appointment of a judges. First, the collegium will recommend the name. So, after the recommendation of name by the collegium, it is given to the executive. So, they will check the background and review the names recommended by the collegium and then give to the the president. So, after the approval of president, he will be appointed as the judge. Then he will take the oath. So, this is the process of appointment of judges. So, here you can see after the recommendation, there is an interference of the executive. So, they are taking mean long time to approve this or reject this. So, this is the main first reason for the delay in the appointment. So, next reason is that suppose they are going to reject, then it will go to the collegium again and they are recommending another names. So, there is a back and forth process. This is also leading to the delay of the appointment in the Indian judiciary. And the third is that I said about the review and the background check which is conducted by the executive or the central government. So, this can be time consuming. So, this is I highlighted in the third point. Talking about the time frame, actually the judiciary has mentioned about the timeline, but there is no legal enforcement to ensure the time within which they have to make the appointment and the transfer. So, this is also a major reason for the delay in the appointment. One major criticism about the Indian judiciary is that huge amount of pending cases in the India. So, as there are many pending cases, much of the efforts and time are going into this. So, there is no extra time or special time to make the appointment. So, this overburden is affecting the appointment process in the Indian judiciary. So, in this article discussion, we saw what is collegian system and what are the main reasons for delay in the appointment. So, with this knowledge in mind, let's see a prelims practice question. Which of the following is not a member of the collegium system? So, A, Chief Justice of India. So, this is correct. And two, the Union Minister of Law and Justice. So, this option is wrong. He is a member only in case of NGAC and not collegium. The four senior most judges in the Supreme Court. Yes, we have seen he is a part of composition of the collegium in case of appointment of the Supreme Court judge and senior most judges of the high court concerned. So, he will be in the composition of collegium in case of appointment of high court judge. So, the correct answer will be B. With this, we will conclude the discussion on this article and now let us move on to the next one. So, this is the next news article that we are going to discuss. So, this article is given in the newspaper The Hindu, page 1 of 23rd September. So, recently the presidential election took place in the country of Sri Lanka and Anura Kumar Disnayak has been elected as the president of Sri Lanka. So, it is important to note that he is from the party known as the National People Party. So, it has been several decades that a person other than uh, Sri Lanka Freedom Party or the United National Party has been elected as the president. So, in GS2, we have a topic known as the constitutional scheme of other countries. So, we have to compare the constitutional scheme of India with that of other countries. So, with this topic as the backdrop, we will see about the semi-presidential system existing in the Sri Lanka from the prelims and 
means perspective. So, Sri Lanka is having a unique political structure which is a combination of both parliamentary and the presidential system. So, talking about the parliamentary form of government and the presidential form of government. So, these are the two types of democratic political systems in the world, namely the parliamentary and the presidential form of government. So, we have to note some key differences to understand the features of both. First is the president and the prime minister. So, parliamentary system is the form of government which India is following. So, here the president is the head of the state and the prime minister is the head of the government. Make note of this key difference. And next is the presidential form of government. So, here the president will be head of the state as well as the head of the government. This is one major difference between both. And next is the separation of powers. So, we have three organs of the government namely executive, legislature and the judiciary. So, here there is a clear demarcation of power in case of the presidential system, but it is not in case of the parliamentary system. There is a no clear demarcation of powers and role between them. And thirdly, we have the responsible form of government in case of parliamentary system. Let me explain what is responsible government. So, we have the executive and the legislature. So, the legislature consists of the PM, council of ministers and the other member of the parliament. All this form the legislature. But the executive is just the prime minister and the council of ministers who will execute the laws which are made by the legislature. So, in case of the parliamentary form of government, the executive which is the prime minister and the council of minister is responsible to the legislature. This is the key feature of the parliamentary form of government. But in case of presidential, it is not so. So, having this in mind, we have to see the semi-presidential system which is a blend of both. So, first feature is the dual executive. Here we have the president and the prime minister. So, the president will be the head of the state similar to that of India and he will be the commander in chief of the armed forces. Here he, uh, we can note that he is important because he is handling all the important ministries such as the defense, foreign policy and the national security and he is directly elected by the people. As it is mentioned in the article that the presidential election for the president of Sri Lanka has occurred recently. But in case of India, we are following an indirect election. Here, the president is elected by the representative of the people, such as the electoral college. That is, the people or the representative who elect the president are first is the elected. MP. So, elected MP is that we have the legislature in the union level. So, they are, they consist of Lok Sabha as well as the Rajya Sabha. So, in both the houses, we have some nominated members as well. So, only the elected members from both the houses are included in the presidential electoral college. Similarly, we also have the elected MLA. So, here you can note that in case of the state level legislature, only the lower house that is the legislative assembly that too only the elected members are included in the presidential electoral college of India. So, on the whole it consists of elected MP and the elected MLA. So, but in case of Sri Lanka, there is a direct election. They are elected for a period of about five years. Talking about the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, he is the head of the government and he will lead the cabinet. So, he will usually be the leader of the majority party in the parliament. So, now talking about the separation of powers, we already see it is a blend of both parliamentary and the presidential system. So, the executive powers will be shared between the president as well as the prime minister. As already seen, he will take all the important ministries such as the defense, foreign affairs and national security and he will be responsible to conduct all the day-to-day -day affairs and policy making in the Sri Lanka. So, traditionally, the president is having a more influence, but based on the political situation, the balance of power can vary. Now, we will see what are the key responsibilities of both these roles. First, the president, he has to appoint the prime minister, who is the leader of the majority party in the parliament. He also has the power to dissolve the parliament but only in case of the certain conditions. And as already said, he will control all the key ministries. He also has the power to declare the emergency. Now, talking about the responsibilities of the Prime Minister, he will oversee the domestic governance and he will lead the cabinet in the parliament. He will also represent the majority party in the parliament. So, these are the 
responsibilities of the president as well as prime minister in case of the sri lanka constitution system now we have the parliamentary role so it is a unicameral body which means uni means one cameral means house so it is a single house talking about the india so at central level we have state level both have the legislative bodies so as uh, the main function of the legislature is to make laws so we have the lower house lok sabha and the upper house rajya sabha similarly in case of legislature in state we have the legislative assembly and legislative council but in case of sri lanka parliament there is only one legislative house this is what they are talking about and the main function of this parliament is to pass laws to approve the budgets so the budget consists of receipts as well as expenditure and they will also oversee the executive so what is the check and balance in case of the sri lanka so here the parliament has the power to move a no confidence motion and which will enable the pm to resign but in the same time the president has the power to override the power of the parliament so this is having a check and balance on each other now we will see what are the challenges in this presidential system as we have seen the features of the semi presidential system in the earlier slides so here you, you have to understand that president as well as the prime minister is there there is a situation or there can be a situation where both these roles are elected from a different party such as party 1 and party 2 and this can lead to clash between both these ideologies which can lead to potential conflict between both these prime minister and the president also there can be a overlapping of powers between these two so this overlapping of powers of these both these executive can lead to confusion among the government as well so suppose let's say there is a failure so both can blame on each other that it is the role of other person to do so so this is what they are talking about the shifting responsibility which can blur the accountability of the role so we saw the main ministry such as the defense foreign affairs and the national security are with the president so he has also power to declare the emergency also to override the parliament in certain cases so this can lead to the domination of the president on the prime minister as well as on the parliament so this can weaken the role of prime minister in the system usually the roles and powers of these uh president as well as prime minister is not clearly mentioned in case of constitution that's why there is a major amendment in the constitution uh, let's say in the france as well as in case of sri lanka so this can lead to confusion and disputes among them as well as lead to un uncertainty and the instability in the government so these are the major challenges in the semi presidential system of sri lanka so with this knowledge let's see a prelims practice question consider the following portugal france poland sri lanka finland which of the above nations of the following have a semi presidential system so the correct answer will be d all five countries are having a semi presidential system make note of these five countries you can quote it as an example portugal france poland sri lanka and finland with this we'll conclude the discussion on this article and now let's move on to the next one so take a look at this news article taken from the newspaper indian express so this news article highlights about the defense cooperation between india and us so this can be done by sharing the information regarding the threat vulnerability mitigation in the energy sector so based on this article we will discuss about the defense cooperation between india and us we will also see what are the challenges in the indo us relationship so first let's start with three key agreements in the defense sector cooperation signed between us and india so all these three agreements are signed at an interval of 2 years each so first let's see about the logistic exchange memorandum of agreement which was signed in the year 2016 so what this agreement says is that both these countries can use each other's military bases for the purpose of one refueling and another for sharing the supplies so this agreement has the capacity to improve the military capability and the operability and second we have an agreement called as the communication compatibility and the security agreement so this agreement 
agreement was signed in the year 2018. So, let's say there are two military equipments between these countries. So, they will ensure that the shared information of data and communication between these two equipments is secured. In this way, it will help us to efficiently coordinate among the military equipments. So, this is the main objective of this COMCASA agreement. Next, we have the BECA agreement known as the Basic Exchange and the Cooperation for Geospatial Cooperation. So, here the keyword is Geospatial Cooperation. So, based on this agreement, they will share the geospatial data between both these countries. So, this will help us to target the required particular target accurately and it also helps in the case of the navigation. So, these are the three agreements. Let us see what are the basic objective of three agreements. First, it helps in the logistic support as already seen. It also helps to secure the communication between the military equipments. We also have the geospatial intelligence because they are going to share the geospatial data among them. So, now we will see about a basic initiative which is taken among them which is the Initiative 1, Critical and Emerging Technology. So, what is this ICET? It is nothing but both these countries, which is US and India, they are going to jointly collaborate on some advanced technologies. So, what is the aim of these technologies? The aim of this technology is to ensure the national security of both these countries. So, how will they work? They will share the technology among them and this will ensure the national security. So, the two key words or the key focus of this ICET is the technology sharing and the national security. So, now we will see what are the significance of this IECT. First is to strengthen the bilateral defense ties. So, by transferring the advanced technology between both the countries, this will promote the joint defense projects. So, in this way, it will enhance the military capability of both the countries. So, this is the first significant of this ICET, which is to strengthen the defense ties. Next is to align strategically and to ensure the regional stability. So, the defense cooperation between India and US will enhance the security in the Indo-Pacific region specifically and this will help to enhance the peace. And third, we have the technological edge. So, as already seen, they are going to cooperate and collaborate on advanced technologies such as AI and cyber security along with the autonomous system. So, this will strengthen the military defense capability and the cyber security strength of both the countries. So, now talking about the economic and industrial benefits, as they are jointly collaborating and working, it will increase the joint venture and the co-production. So, as they are producing jointly, it will enhance the economic growth of both the countries by creating job opportunity in the market. So, now we have the diplomatic and the strategic autonomy. So, usually India is dependent upon Russia and France significantly for its military supplies. So, that is why if you are having a defense relationship with the US, we can diversify the options. It will be highly beneficial for India to reduce the reliance on one single country. And we also have the tech technological transfer and export control. So, as we are working together, this can help us to ease the US export restrictions for India. So, in this way, it will also help us to access easily on the critical technologies which is prevalent in case of US. So, until now, we saw what is ICET and what is the significance of it. So, now we will see what are the challenges in the relationship. First is the geopolitical tension. So, both the countries, both India and US have the objective to control the influence of China. But the approach to control the influence is different. Why? Because India has to control the influence of China by diplomatic approach. While US wanted to strengthen their military in the Indo-Pacific region, to control the influence of China in the region. Another concern is that US is giving military aid to the Pakistan. So, this is a high concern to India. In the same way, we have India who is having a strong relationship with the Russia in case of defense as well as in case of energy. So, this is highly concern, concerning to US. And second is the defense issue. So, we have an agreement called as the CATSA. So, this is an agreement of US based on which is if any country is having 
an involvement with three countries namely the russia iran and north korea so they have the power to impose sanctions on them so whichever country is having an involvement with these three countries us will impose a sanction but we have so but we have uh, acquired the s400 missiles from the russia so the us can impose the sanction on russia india on this basis so us is also criticizing uh, many internal matters of india such as the religious freedom their minority rights as well as the jammu and kashmir issue between the pakistan and india so this is seen as the inter interference of the internal matters of india another is the immigration policies h1b visa restriction as well as the consequently changing the immigration policies of us is also impacting the professionals from india existing in us this is also a major concern also talking about the societal values both these countries are having a very different approach with respect to the societal matters especially in case of lgbtq so this can also cause friction between both these countries so in this article we saw what is the major agreement signed between india and us in the defense cooperation we also saw what are the major challenges in the relationship between india and us so with this knowledge in mind let's go to a prelims practice question so what is the primary purpose of the logistic exchange and memorandum of agreement between india and us to share the geospatial data for military operations to allow both countries to use the each other's military bases for refueling and supplies so the correct answer will be b because option a we have an agreement called as beca which have the objective to share this geospatial data so the logistic exchange agreement has this objective to use each other's military base so some Similarly, for the option C, to enhance the secure in communication between military equipments, we have the communication compatibility and the security agreement. So, the correct answer for this question would be B. So, now we have come to end of today's video. If you found the video informative, do hit like, give your feedback, says comment and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you. Have a nice day.